Hello and welcome to Happy Mum, Happy Baby, Asking for a Friend. Now, so much has changed with parenting post-pandemic, pre- and postnatal classes, doctor appointments, and of course, going back to work. So this week, I've invited an old friend of the podcast and my mate in to talk about flexible working, how to ask for it, what it is, and what you can expect to get. Today's guest is an author, an editor, a radio host, and the founder of the Flex Appeal campaign. It's Anna Whitehouse, a.k.a. Mother Pucker. Hello. Hello, love. All right. <laughs> How are you? I think the last time we spoke was pre-pandemic. I mean, in those times... What were we worrying about? We were getting our knickers in a twist. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, you know, Armageddon hits. Um, yeah, I think it was, uh, wait, it was two, three years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've been on your podcast since then. Yes, you have. We just like meeting in air-conditioned rooms. To be honest, I would talk to you about anything today. It's 42 degrees outside. <laughs> I don't care what the topic is. Gender pay gap. <laughs> I don't know, boob sweat. I'm here for it. <laughs> I mean, both very, very important things. Very important. <laughs> no one talks about the boob sweat enough. I pulled pair of glasses because I'm one of those people that well I, I lose them if they're on top of my head so I put them down like a little bit and put them on my bra I pulled them out the other day and they were soaking dripping with my boob sweat there you do you know do you remember the pencil test where you put a pencil under your boobs to see yes. if they'd hold it and if yes. they did they're a bit saggy I'm entering into the pencil case test now. Right. Like there's such there's such a droop <laughs> on the old ladies. <laughs> could we get a whole set of Crayola up there? I think I think we could. There you go. Amazing. Oh. So let's talk about what we're actually here to talk about, Anna. But yeah. I think I think in some way that could be a segue. I feel and I'm here for that. I'm flexible either way. <laughs> flexible. Flexible working. Yes. What is it? Why is it important and what what makes you so passionate about it? Because you've been doing it for as long as I've known you. You've yes. been really banging this drum. So what led you to, to really, you know, focus on this topic in the first place? Well, I think it came from a... Initially, uh, there was imposter syndrome. You know, like, why on earth should I be the person to pipe up about this? You know, someone's going to be more articulate. Somebody's uh, going to be more impassioned. Someone's going to have more time. I had a child at the time and... Um, I remember actually just, it was primitive. It was maternal. It was quite visceral, the moment, because mm. I thought, good God, I'm going to be raising this little girl to work hard in her ABCs, her GCSEs, perhaps her A-levels. Maybe she gets a degree. Then she goes into the workforce. And I'm raising her for a fool. Um, I'm raising her for that brick wall that I hit where mm. the workforce just goes, yes, you can all sit with us. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, are you pregnant? Apart from you. Uh, and I think that's where it started was I can't raise that little girl and you can't raise your little boys up for a world where it's deemed emasculating to be a father mm -hmm. and where uh, it is assumed that you're the primary caregiver as a woman when perhaps you want it to be more equal. Um, so that's where it really started. Do you think there's also been a massive shift because so many of us now return to work, we, we continue to work. Both, if if it's a if it's a two partner family, both sets, are, uh, both people are working. So that so in in a way, people are just doing it, but the change has to happen to facilitate that. Yeah, I think that. So I started it because I'm Dutch, and so in Holland, where I was living, I had one baby in Amsterdam and one baby in London. So I've experienced the difference. Yeah. Okay. Give you some context. When you've had a baby in Holland, you get 10 days of a maternity nurse called a Kramzorg. Um, she basically lives with you. She feeds you. She helps you breastfeed. She wraps you in cotton wool. I, my Kramzorg was called Nell. I'll never forget. And she said, I've looked up on your Instagram and it seems that you like a banana and strawberry smoothies. And I've just made you one. That's all on the NHS over there. I need there. a Nell in my life. <laughs> I need her every day. But the reason they do it, and this is where you ask about the difference in terms of flexible working here, they invest in maternal mental health there. So they think if you protect that woman post-birth, which is, let's be honest, a biological head fuck. Yeah. Um, if you protect her then, you're not going to need to invest in her mental health as much later on. At that juncture, and I think coming back to this flexible working discussion, it's a biological shift we go through. It's a heady cocktail of separation anxiety, of perhaps birth trauma, postnatal depression. Sorry to anyone listening who um, <laughs> is thinking of having children. It's really lovely. It's highs and lows. Uh, this is just the low bit. And I think it's about being human in business that's why I've done this why I keep going against to be honest waves of 
misogynistic comments. Uh, you know, some guy said to me the other day, uh, well, you know, I said to uh, a dad who wanted to work flexibly, well, can't you missus do that? Why can't you missus do that? You know, and that's 2022. Yeah. And what, what if his missus is a brain surgeon? You know, like, why is this unconscious bias so ingrained in the way we work and the assumption that women will carry that? So coming back to the Holland and versus sort of England, um, they also have a mama dach and a papa dach uh, where they go, do you know what? Raising children is a job in its own. So a mama dach, you take a day off. No parent, and I don't mean mother here, no mm -hmm. parent in Holland goes back full time, right? Really? No one. Because they look at you and they go... It's a job, right? It's not like some recreational side hustle raising a child. It is Mother Nature's biggest challenge and yeah. privilege. You know, as somebody who's, as you know, suffered a uh, recurrent miscarriage, mm -hmm. it's a privilege, but it is also a job. And you come to the UK and there's this just head in the sand approach that I had and I think you've probably had and anyone listening probably had where you thought, I won't even think about, you know, how my work life will look when I have a child. They all just seem to disappear and go and live in Gilead somewhere. So uh, <laughs> we'll just keep working until uh, a drop off a cliff. Mm. And I, yeah, to answer your initial question, I couldn't raise my girls for that fall from such a high cliff. Who was it that said... You can't pass go and collect 200 because you've had a baby. Yeah. And I think that is it for me, uh, is that I can't, I can't see my two little girls and your three boys aged, let's say, 18 and not knowing there's a level playing field. My daughter at the moment wants to be a seagull catcher, so I don't really know. Um, <laughs> I don't really know, to be honest, <laughs> how I can help her there. But if there is a trajectory of that career, yeah. I want her to be able to follow it through to the end. Yes. You know? Yeah. And that's it, is clearing the path from the misogyny, from the discrimination yeah. that is there on both sides, mm -hmm. male and female. The assumption that your sons will just um, carry on working while, yeah. your, while my daughters will step back from their careers that they fought tooth and nail for, you know, um, and it's to level that playing ground. Well, and the tricky thing in our, I, the, the tricky thing is, I think that a lot of people want to go back for work, back to work. That's what they want to do, but also cost of living. Both parents need to be at work so that they can actually live in their house, that they can feed their children. Yeah. So it's, it's not, not like even a little to hobby. Them. Yeah, it's not a hobby. <laughs> you know, they they need to be there. So um, I, I just think if 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 employers can make it work for everyone, then they should be. Well, it's really basic stuff. So uh, I get a lot of kickback, and I think it's really interesting. Before the twenty third of March, twenty twenty, when we went into lockdown. I had so many companies going, you know, really love love what you're doing, but it won't work for our industry, mm. you know. And actually, we've done a lot of work with the Trade Union Congress, and we worked out that the only job you can't do flexibly is probably on an oil rig. You know, that's... Really? You think you can do core hours, or you can do um, compressed hours, you can do job shares, or as I think I've said before, my dad uh, calls it job pairing, pairing two brilliant minds together. Mm -hmm. The rhetoric around it, of it being a big laborious thing, God, God, I've got to sort out this job share. No, job pair two brilliant people together and you get more bang for your buck, essentially. Yeah. Why are we seeing it as such a negative thing? But the re... I suppose realigning of um, what uh, the post-pandemic flexible working world looks like is that can we even stop seeing it as a thing you have to do is about inclusive working. Mm. It's not flexible working, it's inclusive working. Are you, uh, as many companies are piping up about, as press releases I get every, <laughs> every week, I am a diverse and inclusive employer. Well, are you? Because actually, if you don't effectively implement flexible working, you're pushing those out who are disabled, who perhaps can't come in every day. You're pushing out those with caring responsibilities like you and I, mm -hmm. where, you know, I still get the call from nursery. Uh, it's always mum. Yeah. It, I've asked for it to be dad, still comes to mum. Um, there is that distortion, I think, of where that weight of work sits. But you're ultimately... You're closing your doors to talent and, um, you know, you're looking at a world of talent, regardless of, you know, their life responsibilities and going, do you know what? You can't sit with us. Mm. And the people that can sit with them uh, tend to be male because uh, they don't need to go on maternity leave, <laughs> tend to be sort of white collar industries where it becomes a boys club, mm -hmm. tends to be those situations where networking happens um, perhaps in the pub on a Friday afternoon where most women, because the burden of childcare is still on our shoulders, 
tend to uh, have to go and look after the, their children, yep. these guys' children. So that's where all the promotions happen. Mm -hmm. So it's so weighted against us still. And Boris Johnson was saying he wanted to build back better. I'm like, C can we actually just build back differently? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I want to do Yeah, is rehash the working world so that it's level at the very least. Anna, on Asking for a Friend, we ask our guests to bring in three questions that they are asked the most. Yes. What are you asked the most? One of the biggest questions I get is, what does flexible working mean for you? Is it just working from home? And flexible working is, uh, ironically, if you define it, it becomes immediately inflexible. So if I said to you, it's compressed hours, then yeah, yeah, that's yeah. assuming... And compressed hours means that uh, you just, basically you do, do the more, same job, but... More you know, in a sort of shorter period yeah. of time. Um, you know, it can be any way of working that works for you and your employer. So I think it's having that flexibility of mindset. So... Mm -hmm. Flexible working is a relationship. And I think once you treat <clears throat> employees as individuals, instead of what happened to me when, and I, I think anyone listening right now has probably either experienced it through a friend or experienced it themselves when your flexible working request is denied with the these very words, uh, we can't give it to you because then we'll have to open the floodgates to everyone else. What reason is mm. that? What a fear that uh, other people might work in this way that we know is productive. Yeah, We know works for people. We know that if you're given, I don't need big bonuses. I, I just need to see my family. <laughs> so <laughs> if I'm given and treated like a human, not, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, mangled battery hen, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm treated like a human, I'm going to stay. Yeah. I'm going to stay and I'm going to work my ass off for that company. And you know what? The company saying, well, we gave flexible working to one person and then they sat in their underpants watching Homes of the Bahamas and I couldn't trust them. That's one person. That is a recruitment issue. That is not a flexible working issue. Mm -hmm. Recruit the right people, treat them in a good way, include talent and then measure it. Uh, so this whole argument of, God, you know, I miss those water cooler moments, which is the argument from uh, government so no at the moment. So no romances can happen. <laughs> <laughs> I have never had a good water cooler moment. Oh! Oh, that's the only thing I would want to be in an office for. Are you being serious? <laughs> no, the not. awkwardness where, you know, you're asking Sheila at the water cooler going, oh, what are you doing this weekend? I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no events. I, I just need to crack on and get home to my family. Yeah. I'm exhausted. But anyway, I think, you know, there's... And also the other argument was um, around, you know, oh, God, what are we going to do with city centres? You yeah. know, like, preps are going to go down. I'm sorry, but, like... Pret's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, that avocado wrap's going to sell itself or yeah. wherever it goes. And maybe we'll see less concentration in city centres, a broadening of um, people being able to work in places they can afford, yes. talking about the cost of living yeah. crisis we're in. Are we not going to be, are we not allowed to enable people to live in, in areas they can afford mm -hmm. and still work, mm -hmm. you know, not be penned to this expensive commute. So I think coming back to the question, uh, I don't want to hear any more that binary flexible working is just working from home. It's yeah. not. Uh, like I said, inclusive working. That's all I want to hear. Love it. <laughs> um, the next question is how do I approach my old boss, uh, old school boss about working flexibly? How do I approach my old school boss about working flexibly? So uh, I think this is a really good one for anyone looking to sort of drive change within your company. So I think I used the example of James Clary from Coots Bank uh, years ago, and he gave the best advice. So he was described as going rogue when he implemented flexible working. Right. And uh, his idea of flexible working came from an employee who said, I hope you don't mind me suggesting this, but um, I wondered if to HSBC or NatWest have heard, they just gave each employee within their department 10 minutes to ask, like, what's the rub in your day? Like uh, I said to you earlier, yeah. what stresses you out, G? Yeah. <laughs> like, what's going on in your life? Yeah. Give them 10 minutes each and try and work a little bit flexibly around each other. But what was really interesting in that is he led with an example from his competitor, going, this is what NatWest are doing. This is what HSBC are doing. And this is great. And he did do that. And then James Clary implemented flexible working across his department. Right. And uh, productivity went up 30%. 
And the big guys at the top were like, what have you done? You've gone rogue. <laughs> and I think my, my answer to that is to don't underestimate the power of your own voice. Uh, you don't need to be abrasive. I would say if you've got a really like, you know, you know those horses at the Grand National that put their sort of clod hoppers into the soil before going mm -hmm. over Beecher's Brook. If you've got somebody like that that you're working for, perhaps send them, uh, not passive aggressively, really positively, the Working Forward Pledge from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. It's full of incredible companies that are getting behind flexible working. So it's a charter you can sign. It's a first step, you know, yeah. going, by the way, Ford are doing this. By the way, Pets at Home are doing this if you're in the pet industry. There is a competitor for every single industry in there. And it's an opening to that conversation. Well, and also, I say, you know, you say it's a competitor, but also the, these people are doing what we're doing and they've made it work. Exactly. So it's kind of opening their eyes to... It's a sort of gentle way of going, yeah, we're a bit behind the curve here. And yeah. look, this isn't fail safe. That, that's obviously if it's slightly amicable. If it's not, then I would really, really suggest you speak to working families. The Working Families Free Legal Helpline has helped so many people uh, that I have worked with that I have he heard that I've heard from over and over and they will give you sound legal advice on how you can actually approach that well if we do it for you we'll have to do it for everyone mm. you know which isn't a legitimate business reason no <laughs> it's not it's not legally tight you know you're not like, handing out the biscuits like, hey, not... <laughs> if I give you a biscuit I've got to give your brother's one and you can't possibly it's and you gonna... <laughs> do have to give everyone the biscuit yeah. um, so I think those are two sort of ways around it and, and feel free to speak to me Get into my DMs if you're struggling because I can let you know and I can point you, signpost you. That's my job in this. I'm not a charity. I am not an organisation fighting for this. I am exhausted hack, is the way to describe <laughs> it, who is amplifying what other organisations are doing and almost pulling together those that need the help with those that have the support. Yeah. So please don't feel you're on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm here, Working Families is here, the Fawcett Society is here, Trades Union Congress is here, Equality and Human Rights Commission is here. We've got your back. And I think the other thing is, I bloody love the nine to five. Okay, mm. I get so much flack from people from people saying, I like nine to five, I like having boundaries. And that's the thing, it works yeah, for some people. It does. It's great. I, I'm not fighting to break it down. I'm fighting yeah. for choice. There's yeah. a very big difference. So don't feel like, God, everyone's now got to work at home because some people like you might enjoy a water cooler moment. You're on your own, <laughs> completely. <laughs> but... If that's what tickles your fancy, then go I've for it. I've got to say, you know, talking about productivity and stuff, um, you know, it, during that period, I loved the Zoom calls where no one had upgraded and they were only 40 minutes. You knew it was 40 minutes. And if someone didn't speak quickly in that last 10 seconds, see you later. You didn't even have to do the awkward goodbyes. Who's going to leave so the call? True. No one. Bye. We've done all we needed. Oh, my God. I'm, I just loved seeing into the offices and the human... I think the human side of big CEOs. So yeah. I was doing lots of podcasts during the pandemic around, obviously, flexible working. And suddenly I was singing to the CEO of HSBC's uh, office where yes. all the pictures from his kids were up. And yeah. I'm like, finally, we're actually seeing a human, mm -hmm. not this uh, walled up sort of close the door, you can't speak to me or see me. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're a dad. Yes. That alone helps I think in humanizing someone yeah absolutely um what is your final question <laughs> I love mostly online when I do quite a political post and then I get messages people going um I really love what you're saying where's your jump where's your jumpsuit from <laughs> I, I totally agree with your point Where, where's that jumpsuit from <laughs> it's kind of the guilty feminist <laughs> <laughs> and I was like you can love a jumpsuit and still be a feminist it's totally fine <laughs> um, so I get them from Monkey and I have talked about them a lot because there came a point in sort of campaigning and parenting where you know you just need one item of clothing to put on that's wiped clean yes that's it for me <laughs> that kind of grazes over your body you don't have to think about it it's like wearing a sleeping bag it takes you <laughs> seamlessly from day to night so I wore one of these jumpsuits to a parliamentary round table about two, three years ago. It was nothing particularly jazzy. It was just, uh, you know, slight geometric print, if I had to uh, recall. Um, and I, taught my, I took my daughter with me because uh, I wanted her to see Parliament yeah. and to actually understand why I'm not there that often. You know, why I'm stepping away, ironically, at times from my own family yeah. to try and support 
her family in the mm -hmm. future. There's a really big educational piece I think we can do with our children to explain to them they're not stupid. They are little adults in small they are adults in small bodies. Yeah. And I think that explanation of what mummy does, what daddy does, helps them to form a picture of the fact they're not being abandoned yeah. at times. And um, I remember being there and she was looking around at everyone in uh, Parliament going, why are they all so boring? Why are they all wearing grey and really boring? Why are you wearing a clown suit? <laughs> Nothing like kids I, bring you back down the earth. And I thought she was going to say something really empowering, like, you know, you're so colourful and vibrant. Like, why are you dressed like a clown? And everyone else is really <laughs> smart. And I remember thinking, uh, I did have moments thinking I should, uh, much like I think we used to think you should man up yeah. or you should dress a certain way, wear the trousers, etc. And I remember thinking that when I went into Parliament, I need to dumb down. I need to, like, really minimise myself. I should not have personality in Parliament. Mm. When actually, what helps uh, if there's anyone here wondering how to, I think, like remove that imposter syndrome and actually speak up and getting to that point where I thought I wasn't the person to say what I've said, uh, where you think there's going to be someone else better. Actually, be yourself. Um, lean into yourself. And I, I'm not somebody who is naturally bullish in those environments. Um, and what came with quite a vibrant jumpsuit at that round table, there was a very bullish MP who kept talking over every woman who tried to speak. And somebody said to me, um, stay yourself, don't dress in a different way. I mean, obviously, you know, I didn't need, um, I wasn't wearing sort of knee highs, etc. <laughs> you can wear, I mean, but you do you, uh, you do you. And um, she said, if you aren't really outspoken and you're not as bullish as some, we've all been in those meetings where you get talked over, just remember, you can put a placeholder in a conversation. So if someone's steamrolling ahead, you can gently interrupt them. So if you're if you're talking, I can go, yes, I think. And then you can step back mm -hmm. and they know to come to you next. You form your thoughts and then you can quite, quite calmly explain your point instead of having to shout over someone. Because raising your voice isn't shouting. No. Raising your voice is being yourself, being firm in what you want to say. And I think finding the way you want to speak instead of like shifting yourself for others. So mm -hmm. I'll continue to wear the jumpsuits, even if I look like a even if I look like a clown. And I will continue to speak, not scream or shout, because that's how I want to be heard. And I think we all have the right to be heard uh, as ourselves. Yeah. And to turn up, show up, I think as Sheryl Sandberg says, lean in, which I don't <laughs> agree with always, um, as ourselves. Because yeah. otherwise we're telling our children to be something else to be heard. On Asking for a Friend, we asked Happen Have Baby community to send in their questions. Yes. And they were told this was all about flexible working. Uh, so we've got a whole range of questions. Um, someone actually has said that she likes going to the office. For me, it helps me switch between the roles and then leave it at my desk. Which, you know, I think, and, and I guess that leads into another com uh, question that someone has said, which is that if they're working from home, they find it really difficult to set boundaries of like, now I'm switching off and now I'm going to be with my kids. Yeah. And, and I wondered if you had any, like, any tips and tricks that you have for just keeping that separate in a way but I guess I I, I mean I'm I work from home I I am I'm a freelance so my work is all varied and there are times where it does kind of bleed a little bit and I'm all a bit frazzled yeah but there are things that you can put in place to help yourself totally working from home isn't some flexible working utopia yeah we are burning out mm -hmm. you are overproductive at yeah, home for these employers fearing that we do less at home it's complete opposite mm -hmm. and i i know bp trialed um working from home when it wasn't pandemic uh, enforced and they were like productivity went through the roof it was amazing for the company but then people started getting ill People started having significant mental health issues, right. weren't seeing their families, weren't connected. And that's why we work with um, Sir Robert McAlpine, because they are enforcing flexibility on construction sites, for example, because uh, the rate of male suicide on construction sites is through the roof. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's why we have worked with them, because I don't want this to be seen as some knackered mum campaign. It's yeah. not. It's as much for me as it is for those men who are isolated and not seeing their families. Yeah. And so I think there's this uh, misconception that working from home is this, you know, flexible working utopia. It's not. You can be 
overproductive and you can burn out if you don't have the right boundaries in place. Those boundaries um, I have found are quite mad, um, <laughs> I have to say, but I've had to really force myself to do it because I was getting so anxious with this never ending sense of I can work, I can access work and I haven't closed off my mind or put my out of office on. So um, in the morning uh, is a scientist who I read did this and I'll find her name and I'll send it to you because she's brilliant. She would get dressed, showered, get dressed as if she was going to the office, do yeah. a walk around the block and then come back to her desk. So she's seen the outside world. Yes. Because you know that feeling where you just feel co cooped up. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing anything or anyone. So she gets dressed, drops the kids off, whatever, does a walk around the block and then comes back comes back to work. Um, she also set a bell for the, at the end of work. So she set an alarm on her phone. Yeah. So all the family members knew that's when she was logging off. There was really like audible end to the day. Yeah. Then the thing I love the most, which I've started doing and I've had lovely emails back over is saying uh, putting an out of office on every evening um, being very clear about when you are going to be online and when you're not mm -hmm. and you can humanize it much like a you know, magnifying glass into those CEO offices you can say like I did the other day I'm not going to be available between 5 and you know 5 p.m. and 10 a.m. the next day for the next six weeks uh, I'm leaning into Paw Patrol uh, yeah. cuddles trying to be more connected yeah. And it was a message because I can, I suppose, to an extent, because I don't really have anyone working for me or I don't work for anyone. But it was almost a message to anyone emailing me to go, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. And I think any managers listening to this, anyone who can take that slight ownership of those boundaries, do it for your team, show them, lead, put the human noting going, I'm doing bath time yeah. or I'm off out with my mates or you can... Be a person at work. And I think that's what the pandemic did. And those are the three things. They're not watertight, but they've definitely helped me. Yeah. I think anybody just really fight for what really fight for your own boundaries. Like I say that really as a human plea, because I know people completely burning out over that anxiety that you're going to be made redundant if you're not on 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And we need to break that cycle and I know it's a really desperately worrying time at the moment. You feel that, you know, it, it's all very well me saying this with, you know, sitting here privileged going, well, you know, you just need to own your boundaries. It's not as simple as that. Yeah. Because if you've got a manager who you know is, again, coming back to that discrimination we see, is going, well, I can see that Mike's online 24-7 and yeah. Sarah's online, you know, only sort of 12 hours a day. Who's up for promotion? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it comes back to that, uh, that real discrimination. So I, I get it. But I'm just urging, I suppose, more people at the top, please lead and allow others to follow to live and work. Um, back to questions. And actually, uh, two of them are, are very similar and you have covered it. Is flexible working something that is for everyone or just mums? And then someone else asked, does it affect men too? And that is your, what you're working on. You're working on it being for humans. Yeah. It's not something that's just going to be... Because another question was, uh, my children are teenagers. Is there an age limit or can I ask for it now? And you okay, everyone, can. yeah. I mean, I, I started campaigning with Matt, my husband, because I wasn't being listened to. How frustrating is that? <laughs> no. Yeah, so we realised that I was being seen as uh, sort of a bit of Instagram fluff, if I'm being really honest. Um, blonde, jumpsuits, red lips, odd Instagram... Oh, I mean, you know, maybe we'll get a post out of her, but that's it. Matt sat next to me, suddenly a different ball game. Doors opened up, round tables in Parliament, and it was just by having his presence by my side. And that was a strategic move because um, I, and this is not in any way a man bashing exercise, mm -hmm. it's just to acknowledge that we have experienced <laughs> how raising your voice as a woman is very different to raising your voice as a man yeah. in terms of being heard. And um, I like the fact that the optics of it are very clear that this is not just for mums, it is for parents, it is for people, um, it is for my favourite person, she's called Anne, and she's a HR director at Virgin, and she just puts in her diary every Friday, she's like, Anne is at the V&A. <laughs> and cannot stand children, doesn't want children, uh, but she loves going to the V&A when there's no children around. Yeah. And she puts it in her calendar and owns that time. Yeah. It is for Anne as much as it is for me, mm -hmm. as much as it is for a mother of teens, as much as it is for my husband and your boys and my girls. Yeah. Um, one person has uh, written in, and actually, 
well, let's see. I, I feel like we both can relate to this. I feel guilty when I'm working and not with my baby, but I feel bad when I'm working. With, and no, no, no. I feel bad. <laughs> guilt. Oh, gosh. I feel, I feel so guilty. I feel guilty when I'm working and not with my baby, but when I, I feel bad when I'm with my baby and not cracking on with work. Is this my new normal? It's the boundaries thing again, isn't it? It all just kind of bleeds. I did a post recently. Um, I think you liked Giovanna. I think <laughs> I love not, the old jacket. Not, I think I think you I'm like, oh, <laughs> another one from G. Um, about the parental paradox mm. that um, I don't know about you, but I am t- at times just willing her to grow up. I'm like, just grow up, you know, and then just stay small, stay baby, please come into my arms. And it can be within a five minute period that I swing between grow up <laughs> and stay small. And I think we have this pendulum uh, in our minds the whole time. Like I, I try to explain how I felt parenthood hit when I compare my pre-parent self to where I sit on this exhausted day. Um, was, you know, pre-parenting, you would get a seat on the bus and you'd be like, oh, that's good. You'd eat a Kit Kat junkie and you'd be like, oh, that's a good day. <laughs> Maybe you go out, you know, for a beer and a burger with a mate you're like it's all good it's all quite sort of consistent a little bit of up a little bit of down when it comes to parenting you are on your floor or you are on the floor crying uh hyperventilating because someone's not put their shoes on and you've <laughs> you've got you're having a panic attack and it's all very intense and then at the school gates you just get that little arm wrapped around your kneecap mm. and they go oh, i love you mummy and you are on cloud flipping nine Mm -hmm. and it is that pendulum and I think that translates to work and family it's that I want that something but you are my everything you are absolutely everything to me but god I want to fight for that something too because if I lose that and that can be being a mum this is not about just you know fighting for working and I think there's often discussion around full-time I'm a full-time mum everyone's a full-time mum yeah. uh you know everybody is uh mm-hmm. you are they are constantly on my mind have I done you know the have I got the jabs up today have um did I put a frozen ice pack in a lunchbox today is the air conditioning working at school for them mm-hmm. I'm really worried about that should I check in should I check in with the head teacher are they going to be okay it doesn't matter whether you're home or away. Yeah. Your children are ingrained in your mind. And I think that separation anxiety is so um, huge at times. But everyone is a full-time mum. And I think uh, you will, I think, unfortunately, feel that guilt because we are on that pendulum. But there are those moments, those beautiful, beautiful moments where, uh, like uh, you had with your kids coming to work, I mean, it's not the... It's not the usual office, but um, <laughs> seeing your kids playing on a stage in front of how many people? Oh, thousands of people. Thousands yeah. of people. I mean, I, I'd have been bricking it. Um, <laughs> we were talking about this earlier about how, as a child, you actually don't have imposter syndrome. You've just yeah. got, you're just there. You're an yeah. imposter. Yeah, <laughs> you just, exactly. You, in, you impose yourself on situations yeah. without any second thought. And what got me seeing that on your Instagram Mm. was your children having such a significant recognition and understanding of what Tom does, what you do. Mm. And uh, that again, doesn't matter whether, you know, where you work, how you work, but I think we can educate our children on what we're doing to relieve that guilt and not just um, educate them, absorb them in it. You know, like uh, my daughter asked if she could do an interview and I thought, why not? You're nine. And she's seen me interviewing people and she's seen me being a journalist. And my, you know, aside from being a seagull catcher, uh, she she's like, I'd like to <laughs> ask some questions. And I think we can minimize them yeah. too much. And I think those conversations around bedtime stories, sometimes my kids just tell me to shut up. You know, I'm like, do you want to know what mommy did today? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Glad it's not just me. <laughs> Don't give a shit. Where are my fish fingers, chips and peas and poor patrol? Get it on now. Um, but yes, I think don't underestimate them mm. um, because I think you can, you can't bridge that gap. That guilt gap will always be there. But I think you can bridge it with um, conversation and interest. And my daughter, my youngest the other day, I'll never forget it. Like she came downstairs with my shoes on and my glasses on and she just declared, I am Anna Whitehouse. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I thought, that's really nice. And you what know? does she do as Anna Whitehouse? Oh, she doesn't know. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't <laughs> care. She's like, where's the steady flow of, um, you know, of pick and mix? But um, it was really nice. She just had my lanyard on, my shoes on and uh, glasses. And she knew I worked. And I think having seen my mum give up so much of what she wanted for us, uh, I will never forget seeing her in a sort of crumpled heap by the dishwasher crying and I was not young, I think I was about 11. And she was sobbing at what she had given up because society is, had assumed she would give it up. Mm -hmm. And now I think we are in this transition where there's no assumption women will give up their careers when they have a family. Absolutely. Are we in transition? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Do I have debilitating moments of guilt, separation, anxiety? stress <laughs> do i think it's exacerbated my postnatal depression yes i don't think it's easy and i will any employer to recognize that transition at the moment and to know there are other countries doing it this isn't just some fantastical view this mm. is not a revolution it's simply about evolution in a digital world that is willing and ready yeah Anna, we finish the podcast with you answering three sentences. Well, completing Good three God. sentences, I think, is the correct terminology. <laughs> I mean, we've been doing this a long time. I should know. Uh, the first one is, if I could tell you anything, it would be... Don't look up to anyone and don't look down on anyone. Sort of look straight ahead uh, and support where you can. And that's something my dad said to me when mm. I was really young. Uh, he was much like, don't make someone your best friend because it really isolates everyone else uh, and stops you really having your eyes open to other brilliant people around you you know yeah. we don't need to pedestal people and we don't need to demonize people um being a parent means i think it means um like i said earlier not minimizing i think that has been my biggest learning is recognizing they are adults trapped in small bodies. Mm. And uh, I say that, uh, my youngest the other day was walking along uh, a wall and I was trying to sort of usher her to nursery quickly to get to a meeting. And she was walking at the pace of a hedgehog and she turned around and she just went, fucking wait. <laughs> in like the voice of an East End barmaid. And I looked at her and I thought, good God, where'd that come from? And uh, realised she'd picked it up for my husband in the pandemic because every time they asked for a snack, he, under his breath, would go, fuck it, wait. But he obviously didn't realise it translated. So that's what I mean. They're absorbent, but they are little adults. And I think that's parenting for me in a, in a nutshell. Exhausted and them swearing. Uh, and I'm happy when? I'm happy when... It's potentially like a warm sort of raisin in my bra that I haven't realised. You know, that messiness of motherhood <laughs> where you realise you're so dishevelled and you're on the sofa absorbing your family, yeah. like absorbing them in those banal, like awful Netflix series moments um, where you don't really know what time it is, where you've got to go, but time sort of stands still as you look around and go... God, like, I think we're okay mm. for a fleeting moment. Yeah. And holding on to those moments because those are the moments. I've yeah. been chasing so much else for so long and it's sitting still, uh, absorbing the little humans that my husband and I made. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that whether you're a parent or not, it's absorbing your family, which can be your boyfriend, your dog, your yeah. guana your children, just hold on to them yeah. uh, and remove that warm raisin from your bra <laughs> when the time suits. <laughs> and they, they are moments. You know, I yeah. think so many of us are chasing this life that is this perfect kind of everyone happy. You know, what you're sold on Instagram or in the movies, that just doesn't It exist. doesn't exist. It's fleeting. I, when it's fair. I was always striving for, per not perfection, but I was like, oh God, if we have an argument in our relationship, we're going to get divorced. Mm -hmm. It was always like one worst case scenario. Yeah. Oh, well, I was going to the gym, but now I've eaten a Mars bar, I don't think I'll go back. And I've realised uh, happiness is five steps forward, three back. <laughs> Six steps forward, two back. 
that consistent moving yeah. forward, but realizing that you're going to fall over, you're going to be crying, and your daughter is going to go fucking wait <laughs> outside little <laughs> to a group of um, quietly concerned parents. Um, that is all in a day's work as a parent. I love that. And actually, it reminded me of something that um, and a director once said to me on stage, and it's about the audience being the waves and you're a boat, and I think that is life. And and you are the boat, and life is the other is the waves, and that will just keep rocking you. That's and you've such just got to... a calming image. Mm. I'm not sure it sits with um, where tea time <laughs> is for me. Just on the rocking boat, and, big old storm, big old storm. And his name was Eagle Pig. <laughs> <laughs> Having an aneurysm. <laughs> Anna, thank you so, so much. You're, you are always a guest who I feel like I can just chat and chat and chat and chat to. And let's see what the Daily Mail make of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank it's you. always a pleasure. <laughs>